Miracy. Humans have been taught that the only way that they can be connected is that they have to work at it. They have to meditate. They have to be good. They have to forego things that they think are quote unquote not spiritual. They can't be a regular human. They can't make mistakes. They can't be angry. They can't be jealous. This is a false teaching. And it is one of the biggest causes of separation. Hello, and welcome to Consciousness Explored, where we delve into the mysteries of the human experience and consciousness. I'm your host, Melissa Deal. In each episode, we'll be diving deep into the nature of consciousness, ways to expand our consciousness, and the impact that our understanding of consciousness has on the quality of our daily lives. For our season finale, I've invited Robin Jelinek. Robin is a channel for a group consciousness known as Athena. Through Robin, Athena delivers profound messages aimed at assisting individuals in overcoming obstacles and aligning with their true purpose. Their no-nonsense approach promises insights into hidden truths, conflict resolution, and personal growth. I could not be more thrilled to have Robin and Athena here for our special finale episode. I cannot wait to hear what they both have to share. I have a feeling this will be an extraordinary experience for all of us. We'll be right back with Robin's story. I was born in Merton, Wisconsin, and my father was a water well driller there. That's where I grew up until the age of fifth grade. Then we moved up to northern Wisconsin. My dad actually moved his whole practice there, and, you know, we kind of started over in a different kind of life, more country living than what we were presently in. My mom took us to church now and then. It wasn't something that we did regularly, but I did have some exposure to it. I guess in some ways I'm kind of grateful because I was pretty wide open in that arena. I came from a, a family of six girls, and I had the good fortune of having a really great mother, a more distant father. I think fathers were like that back then. They didn't help out all that much, and they kind of you know, did their work, and the mother kind of took care of the kids, and that's the traditional family that I grew up in. But I had a really kind, loving, considerate mother, so I'm really grateful for that. That gave me a really good base. I always carried empathy to a degree that it was uncomfortable. I didn't really know what it was as a child. I just knew that I could feel everything that everybody was wanting and feeling, and oftentimes it was uncomfortable for me to go places. My dad would ask me to get him an apple out of the refrigerator, and if I'd go to the refrigerator and they'd be gone, I would be devastated. It was like I didn't want to disappoint anybody in their request of me of whatever they would ask. And so from an early age on, I felt very different that way as far as just really feeling other people's needs and wants and wanting to satisfy them to the degree that it made me uncomfortable. It wasn't until uh, later in life that I started to realize that you can actually use that to your benefit, that you know it's given to you for a reason so that you can serve humanity. But at the time, it didn't feel that way. It felt like kind of a curse. I was a chunky little girl. I probably was 40 or 50 pounds overweight, and so I did suffer some getting picked on, you know, that kind of thing that you go through in, in your early years in school. And it was something that I actually feel like even at this point is what attracted the group to me that I am channeling is because it really zapped my confidence. Even though I lost the weight early on, I lost 50 pounds, never gained it back, just became a different person in the way that I ate and the way that I took care of myself. And so that was just one of those things that I went through that really affected my confidence throughout my entire life. I met my now husband at the age of 13. We met very young and still with him today. He worked for my father when he was a young man and then went on to start his own water well drilling business. I worked alongside my husband in the water well drilling business. I was raising two children, which I absolutely loved. That was the joy of my life, having my two boys. So very active in school things, anything to do with raising kids. I was able to bring them along to our office because it wasn't a public type office. I always had the ability to have them with me, which I was really grateful for. So that early relationship that I had with my husband meeting at 13, actually growing up and playing together as children went right into a business where we spent every day together. And it's been like that from the beginning and we did that for over 25 years. And then in our early 40s, we sold that business to the employees that worked for us. And um, we spent a lot of time in Naples, Florida. That's where I am now. 
I would say in my early 20s, definitely got on a spiritual path. I can't remember quite what precipitated it, but I just started reading everything that I could. I was very interested in Course in Miracles, Sylvia Brown, any type of mediumship type book. I, I literally read everything I could get my hands on and loved it. And I would try to talk to my husband about it. He'd say, it sounds really interesting, but I'm really busy right now. Maybe someday we can talk more about that. So I just kind of continued all the time through high school and junior high and when I was raising my kids as a pastime, just doing a lot of reading, not so much practices, but just gaining information and, and really just loving it, just enjoying doing it. And then I would say about the time that my kids went to college in my early 40s, I got a little bit more practice orientated. I started to do some breath work, pay attention more to chakras. I had a very strong interest in that type of thing. And it precipitated a kundalini rising in me that happened when I was about 43 years old. Uh, that was a, a pivotal moment for me because it confirmed everything that I had ever read. I was able to feel, hear, and see those energy centers. So I knew that they actually existed. It, it felt like a real gift to be given that, that clarity or that confirmation and not have to just believe something that I had read, but that I could actually see that and feel that in my own body. And then after that happened, that sent me on a whole other journey of reading everything that I could about Kundalini energy and trying to figure out what it is that had happened to me. I experienced the dark night of the soul that many people talk about unknowingly when the kundalini energy gets activated, its main objective or goal is to clean out the vessel, is to rid you of all the negativity and emotion that's gathered within you from this lifetime and, and past lifetimes that's kind of clogging up the system and denying it full access. And so with that comes uh, a lot of self-observation and recall, a lot of judgment and condemnation of yourself and things that you're doing that perhaps you don't like or you've wanted to change but you haven't been able to. When we moved to Florida, and I was probably nearing around age 50 or so, I started to feel a little bit like a people pleaser. I started to realize that I would have opinions but never share them. I started to feel like I didn't know myself that well, that I really was just conforming to what others expected of me or what I thought would be acceptable. And I remember having this pivotal moment of a kind of despair, thinking, who are you? I mean, do you really even know yourself? Who, who really are you? And, and I remember asking that question. And that, to me, was a pivotal moment where I started to really explore letting all of myself be seen, not hiding anymore, not feeling as though something that I would share would affect the way that someone felt about me and that that would be a terrible thing. Uh, it was really like stepping into owning or accepting who I really was without the attachment or worry of how that was going to be perceived by others. There was the Kundalini awakening, and then there was another 20 years, actually, until the group arrived around age 61. I'm 64 now. It was kind of difficult at first. Uh, the transmission wasn't as smooth, and it was a little uncomfortable. And of course, you're not trusting and you're doubting and, and all of those types of things that you have to kind of overcome as a channeler. Then you realize that the more that you relax and the more that you trust, uh, the better and better the delivery gets and the information uh, that comes through you is much clearer and easier to transmit. In the beginning, I would say there was a lot of panic and anxiety and worry about how people were going to perceive me because I was what you would consider uh, a pretty sound person, normal and for all practical purposes. And so there was a great worry within me that people would not perceive me that way anymore, that they would think that I was crazy or making something up or that I would be an embarrassment uh, to my kids or my husband or something like that. And fortunately, my kids fully embraced it and my husband as well. So once I had that under my belt, I didn't feel so much apprehension about it. I have some people that just love it and want to be around it and then other people who don't want to be around you anymore because they, they don't really understand it or feel comfortable really with the whole understanding or idea of it. But what happened is little by little, the universe just kind of helps you. It, it, it kind of very gradually changes you. It's kind of like going through puberty. You don't wake up overnight and decide, okay, I'm a woman now. It's like this very gradual thing happens and you find yourself different than you were. I really have understanding for people who doubt it and don't at all blame them or hold anything against anyone who it isn't for them. I would never push this on anyone. I think your spiritual path and your beliefs are an individual sovereign thing, and that each should be allowed to explore what it is that they're comfortable with in their own time. In a short time, Robin became very comfortable with channeling the group and was doing individual sessions with people for practice when she was asked to be a guest on a popular podcast called Next Level Soul. She was completely unprepared for the explosion of attention that she received from being on the show. 
hundreds of requests for private sessions came pouring in and she was totally overwhelmed. It was as if overnight she was tasked with creating an entire business out of nothing. Fortunately, she was able to bring in her younger sister, Heidi, to help her pull it off. My mother had her at 43, and believe it or not, she had a daughter the same age having a baby at the same time. And Heidi was the baby of the family, so she was eight years different. I was the baby till she came along. And I took care of her a lot because I was eight years older and my mom was older. And so we just kind of had that relationship. But now it's very much one of equality, one that is, you know, I don't look at her as my little sister anymore. I look at her as my equal. And it's just really a wonderful thing. I, I really don't know if I would be doing all the things that I'm doing if it weren't for her. I'm a very family oriented person. And so having her in this with me really motivates me to want to do more of the group things because she's involved in that. So I really love that aspect of it and that's really the driving force behind it is my love for her. Oh, that is so beautiful and I can totally relate. There is no way I would be who I am today or have been able to navigate this path of expansion without my little sister, Jenny. She's my ride or die, and I'm so incredibly grateful for her. So thank you for sharing about that and, and for sharing your whole story. I'm so excited to talk with Athena, the group that you channel. I've gathered some questions from some cherished and curious friends of mine. But before we bring in Athena, I do have one question for you. How would you define or explain consciousness? Consciousness is aware of itself. And oftentimes when I'm having sessions with a human and they don't have a life that's fully satisfying, it's because they're unconscious from most of it. Consciousness is a divinity that is observing life, that is always aware, always knowing, always understanding, always loving, really. And so that's how I would describe a consciousness. Most humans, if not all, live a good portion of their life unconscious. They're not really fully aware of what it is that they are thinking and feeling that's creating the life that they're in. Once you move to the observer of yourself, that is full consciousness. The observer is the divinity part of you watching the human in its expression and being grateful to it and loving it for what it's doing. And that's what, to me, full consciousness is when you're really aware of what it is that you are thinking and feeling and paying attention to it. That's consciousness, full awareness. Okay, excellent. Well, would it be okay for us to speak with Athena? Absolutely. Thank you so much. We are what is called ever-present. The minute Robin thinks about us, we are in. She didn't like that too well in the beginning because, of course, when something like this happens to you, you're thinking about it all the time, aren't you? And therefore, we were at her continually. Finally, she said to us, am I ever going to have a life of my own? How am I supposed to get my laundry done or visit with my husband or any of the things that a human does? And we said, well, if you would quit thinking about us all the time, we would not be coming forward. It is at that moment that she realized that we are thought-provoked. She can go on vacation and not think about us for two weeks and we do not bother her, you see. Thank you so much for being here, Athena. I'm so happy to have you. And may I ask you a few questions? Absolutely. I guess we, we all channel even when it's unintentional. But for those looking to be more intentional in the way they channel, kind of like Robin does, how could people strengthen their ability to channel intentionally? Yes. Yeah. Well, one has to perceive themselves in the way that they want to be. Yeah. And if you continue to perceive yourself as in separation or as just a human or as someone that is less than or different than what Robin is or what we are, yeah, then that is what you will have access to. So in some sense, you have to move yourself into the perception that you are way more than the human that you have been told or think that you are. You have to start to exercise the ability to perceive yourself and prove it to yourself. Humans have been taught that the only way that they can be connected is that they have to work at it. They have to meditate. They have to be good. They have to forego things that they think are quote unquote not spiritual. They can't be a regular human. They can't make mistakes. They can't be angry. They can't be jealous. This is a false teaching. And it is one of the biggest causes of separation. If a human could understand that full embracing and loving of themselves in the way that they feel those things that we just mentioned is actually what opens up your energy centers and connects you to the divine part of yourself. Think about parents and the way that they love their children. There's no limit, is there? There's no judgment, no condemnation, no end to it. And we would tell you that the source part of you is the same with you. But you, you as a human, become jealous, become rageful, become angry, become controlling, all because of your life experience 
or your lineages causing your experience, and you decide you don't like yourself in those ways. I don't like the jealous person that I am. I don't like the angry person that I am. I don't like being controlling, and people are always telling me how controlling I am. As you agree to the negative tone of the emotion that you have chosen, that is only a signal, by the way, to the universe for what your preference really is in your life, you lower your tone and you separate yourself from your source. So here you are, living your life, suffering to some degree, and then blaming and condemning and judging yourself for the way that you have felt in your experience. And you wonder where your stuff is. Your stuff comes in flow. Your stuff comes in equaling yourself to your source. Your stuff comes when you love yourself in all ways. When you no longer judge, you no longer condemn. When a bad feeling feels no different than a good feeling because you recognize that you are a feeler and releaser of emotion, that you are signaling the universe with a feeling so that it may derive a preference and send it to you that you prefer. Why would you decide to judge and condemn the negativity, which was immediately calibrated in positivity in your behalf? Because this is what's causing separation, you see. There's no work to do. There's no efforting. There's just you accepting you. Get out there and live freely. Enjoy yourself. Stop policing yourself. That is the beautiful and thorough answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next question. What is the point of existence for those of us here on Earth? Oh, what's the point in us being here? Everyone is wanting to expand, to grow. You ask any scientist, your universe is growing leaps and bounds, and so are you. Every time that you emote, every time that you have emotion, you are expanding yourself and the divine same time. So this is the goal or the objective in experience. The universe is answerer of questions. As you pose questions to the universe, it wants nothing more than to bring you the answers. And you have to ask in authenticity. You have to ask with that desire, that real wanting to know, wanting to understand. Most of those that are working in the spiritual realms that are channelers are question askers. They have long desired to know the meaning of life and why they are here. And they want answers. And those answers become answered by the universe just by your longing, by your desire, you see. I do. Thank you very much. As far as Athena is concerned, what do you want from us and what do you want for us? And what do you get out of sharing information with us and what would you like to see for us? We are activators of activators. There are all different channelers that are flooding the plane right now because there is a rise in consciousness, if you're not aware, yeah? More and more people are becoming aware that they are creating their own experience and that they are not victims and that they are perfectly capable of achieving the way that they want to feel in their lives. It's not about stuff. A lot of people uh, will go on a spiritual uh, bandwagon. I don't need anything. If you're really spiritual, you don't need anything. That's not what it's about. It's about a feeling. And sometimes someone has a desire for something and it makes them feel a certain way. Maybe the nice house, maybe the nice car, maybe the fame, it might. But all of this is necessary in the evolution of each soul. It's individual. And so as a soul has its desires and they come into connection with those desires, they get to feel themselves in what they thought would satisfy them. And if it doesn't, new desires are born and they go back out and experience again and again and grow and expand. And it might come to a point where they don't need that thing or anything, but it's not going to be because now they're more spiritual than someone else. It's going to be because they've been uh, experiencing that which they desired and then forming new desires because of it, you see. There's simply nothing that a human ever longs for that they should be guilty of or ashamed of or uh, not entitled to. Let's use that term. You are here to experience anything that you want to. You have that right. You are an individual creator. You are here with free will. What is free will? Free will means that I, as a human, based upon all the lives that I have lived and the life that I am living, have the right to choose how I feel about what I live. And I send out that signal to the universe, and it receives it from me in love, in gratitude. It expands because of it, and I can come into alignment with it, provided I feel in release. I love myself and what I chose. 
I don't condemn and judge. I don't need a do-over, you see. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good. That's great. What is one critical piece of wisdom or knowledge that humanity is currently overlooking that might dramatically transform our collective future and consciousness for the better? Their own worthiness. That's it. That they have to do something. That they have to be something. That they've done something wrong. Living, observing, and loving yourself in what you live is the key to connection. It's all that's required. All that's required. Quite simple, isn't it? Yeah. As we stand on the brink of significant technological advances such as artificial intelligence and space exploration, what guidance would you offer to ensure these developments benefit humanity rather than creating further division and disparity? Everything that is created is created through your intent. If you create through fear, through angst, through worry, this thing is going to be bad. This thing is going to happen. What's going to happen? All of the indecision, all of the worry are actually the precipitator or the cause of it going awry or not going in the direction that you would like it to. There are all kinds of predictions right now on a lot of your spiritual channels about not stopping what's coming, about the terrible things that are going to be coming. And they have forgotten that history or the future, let's use that term, is being determined in the now moment. And so if people watch those type of broadcasts and they decide to agree with them and align with that type of belief, then they are the creator of more of same, aren't they? You are individual creator. Did you know that? That you can actually focus on your own individually and the great power that you have would stagger you. That you can add all of the things that you love to your universe, individual, and that when you turn the TV on, you won't see the wars. You won't see the ads for the medicines and the things that are going to make you sick. You only see those when you are aligned to that kind of energy. So you can actually create a cocoon around yourself. And then, as others view you in that wonderful cocoon that you are living in, they can decide that they too want to make a cocoon like that. And everyone starts creating these beautiful universes around themselves and not allowing that precious golden focus to go out into the masses in negativity and not even realize that they're leaking or leaching out their own energy, their own creative energy. Put your focus on what it is that you want to see in the world. When you see something that you wish not to see, don't condemn it. Don't judge the racist people. Don't condemn those that are littering. Look at them and smile and say, thank you for giving me a view that has now made me realize where I would like to put my focus. And then go to that focus. You will never get the change in the world that you want as you condemn and judge something that you don't want. You have inadvertently joined it, you see. Yes, I really love that perspective. And I find that it's, it's difficult for people to understand sometimes because people are afraid of falling into toxic positivity or believing that if they are ignoring their quote unquote responsibility to acknowledge suffering in the world, that, that they're selfish. That's what we call oppositional energy, because what are they trying to do? They're looking at everyone else as though they're bad people, aren't they? These people aren't doing the right thing. I am. These people are not green. I am. These people are racist. I'm not. But they don't feel good as they do that, as they bolster that they are somehow higher than or better than someone else. They have become the same energy that they have a distaste of, and they are not even recognizing it. You will feel good when you are moving in a good direction. And if you are feeling opposition, if you are pushing up against someone, scolding someone even, you are not feeling good and you are not producing anything good. That's fantastic. I love that. I have a question from someone. So as I read it, I will say I, but it is not me. I am seeking to align more closely with my true purpose or path in life, but I'm at a crossroads in my career and personal development. I feel like I'm burning up with all the intense energy I perceive. How do I know which way to go and if it's the right decision or direction? A human has to understand that this universe that they are a part of is connected right to them. So the moment that she had the desire for a different direction or a different career, it was formed in the divine part of herself. So the universe has went ahead and it has organized circumstances and situations that are ready and available to come to her. But as one thinks that they have to look for something, and as one is not happy in the state or place that they are in, they do not emanate the same tone as their source and therefore cannot receive the flow 
of what was created by everything that they have felt. So you have to make peace with where you are to get to where you want to get. And so as she says she feels all these negativities, once again, that could be remedied by as you view something that you do not like the feel of, you recognize what is the preference. And then you go to the preference. And you are grateful to what made you recognize the preference instead of being in condemnation and judgment of it, which would lower your tone, you see. So our advice to her would be is to make peace wherever she is. And if she is feeling something that she doesn't like the feel of, then she is not practicing properly what it is that we have just taught. You are to look at what makes you feel terrible and use it as leverage to push you in a direction of focus of what you want because of that view. And that is how you move into alignment. Alignment is created in love. Whenever you are feeling anything opposite of love, you are in disconnection and you are moving out of flow. And that's where your stuff is. Your stuff is in the flow. It's in connection. And you must move to a state of love in order to obtain that connection and be a match to your source. I understand. I understand. From a cosmic viewpoint, what role does Earth play in the larger tapestry of the universe? And how can humanity contribute? The free will and the amount of contrast that is offered here is huge compared to other planes of existence. And so those that come here will have rapid acceleration in the direction of growth by what it is that they are experiencing when they are occupying a human existence or life, you see. And so it's not easy. We know that a human can suffer in their experience, but part of the earth is a dense plane. And by dense, we mean a human has only access to the three lower energy centers in the body. So you have the root, the sacral, and the stomach. And this is our primary existence. Lack, lust, not enoughness, fear, control, all of those things exist in the three lower energy centers. So you have a limited level of consciousness that you come in with. And as you live on the plane for a while, and you suffer a little bit, you start to decide, I would like to feel better than what I am feeling. And in that plea, the universe receives you. And it starts to move you up into fourth density, which is opening the heart center or the next chakra up starts to open. And you start to observe yourself. You start to recognize, I am the creator of my own experience. I've got something to do with what's going on here in my life. But what comes with fourth density is judgment condemnation. Because I notice what I'm doing, and I know I'm doing it wrong. And I can see other people doing it wrong. So I condemn and I judge. But I'm in the early stages of awakening. If you could just appreciate that stage or that step and accept at least I'm seeing it. At least I now am observing myself in the way that I am moving in my life and I know how I'm creating. Instead of judging and condemning and being aggravated with yourself for doing it wrong, you would quickly move out of that stage and up to fifth density, which is another expansion of consciousness, where you start to create from happiness and joy. You still do things wrong. You still have negativity and feelings, but you don't care. You don't attach to it. You simply feel your experience good, bad, or otherwise, immediately release it, follow the preference in mastery, and start to bring to yourself very quickly, very positive, very creative experiences at a rapid speed because your vibration is speeding, and you become very happy. You think, I know how to create now. All I need to do is let the feeling out. Don't judge and condemn or hang on to it. Immediately know what was created by it, something better. Move in that direction in the way that I feel. See it show up in my life very quickly and I get excited, and I'm no longer creating in the third density, am I, anymore. I am no longer feeling suffering. I'm feeling happy. I'm feeling joyful. I'm feeling capable. I'm feeling powerful. I'm feeling like I can't do anything wrong because I know how to create now, you see. Yeah, so much fun. Okay, the next question is, again, from an individual, a different individual, but I will be using I, but it is not me. I would like to understand the meaning of my dreams and what they're trying to tell me, specifically dreams about flying or floating and also dreams about water. How can I understand these? Dreams are always a representation of feelings. And so the best way to unravel a dream is to determine what it is that you feel when you are participating in that dream. And we would say dreams of flying are freedom, the ability to be free, to do things that perhaps you didn't think possible or that others thought you couldn't do. 
but there would always be a feeling that would be portrayed that you are containing within you or desiring even that would be revealed to you in the dream state. That's beautiful. I like that. Next question. Can you explain human suffering in terms of multidimensionality? So is the question, are we suffering in other dimensions? I feel like the question's intent is more about reframing, perhaps, or getting a new perspective on your suffering because of your multidimensionality. I feel like that's probably the intent. Well, it is to understand that the, the universal part of you or the divine part of you has the ability to transmute energy or to lift it to the level of which it vibrates at. And so the idea of good and bad, of right and wrong, and of suffering doesn't really exist under that premise, you see. So, of course, in the body, imagine if you didn't have your body. You couldn't go hungry, could you? Someone couldn't really hurt you physically. Uh, they couldn't take uh, your lover from you. There would be nothing that could be inflicted upon you if you were not in the vessel that you were in. So the vessel is a big factor of suffering. It is a lot of what is causing your suffering or connected to it. Let's use that term. And that in the senses that you feel in that body, the ability to smell, to taste, to touch, to be drawn into an experience of what you perceive as reality is all coming through the senses. And so it's, it's very difficult to avoid that. But in the divine aspect of you or the greater consciousness, let's use that term, suffering or lower level emotions and feelings are not felt or looked upon in the same way. They are looked at as levels of power or charges of energy. That's the way that they are looked at, you see. Yeah. When we leave this plane where we are, Earth, do we take all the information with us? Memories, feelings, lessons, understandings, and does that stay a part of us? But even personality traits. Yes, yes. You bring everything with you. The chakras are referred to as the wheels of life. Everything that you are feeling is packed up in there. Every emotion that you are either storing or going through is going through those energy centers, and it's being connected to the divine part of you. So there's this constant uh, sending and receiving of information that is going on. Many humans will talk about the, the blueprint or uh, a life that is being planned prior to coming, and we would say the only way that uh, we would argue with that point is that the life that you are uh, blueprinting, you are doing it all along. You are never not a creator. You are never not planning. You are never not growing. And so in every moment as you are making a decision in the way that you feel, that data is being received and experiences and circumstances are being culminated that will fit what it is that you have felt, you see. And so as you leave the plane and you bring all that data with you that has been communicated back and forth between the divine part of you, a new life is already constructed now, isn't it? With those that you will interact with, how you will feel in it. You may not bring the full memory of it because what comes with the full memory of it sometimes is some of the baggage or the things that you carried in the life that you had already experienced. And the divine part of you wants to come in fresh with and to experience fresh, not bringing in maybe past traumas or heartaches. And if you do, not to blame them on a past life, but rather to resolve them in the present life or the one that you are coming into, you see. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. So would you say that our bodies, our avatars, this human thing we're in, would you say it's like a really advanced technology? To some degree, yeah, we would equal it to a computer. There are things, especially in the subconscious mind, the way that things are stored or maintained or kept in the human lends itself towards being a computer or something that you would signify as an, an avatar, as you put it. It's kind of funny now that those are actually being developed and people are projecting their thoughts, their feelings, their ways of being into these avatars that people now have. Yes, that are above uh, the planet. This is something that is popular in your world right now. And why is it popular? Because they believe in that arena that they can be anything, that they can actually be magnificent, that they can be beautiful, that they can be powerful, that they can be accomplished. And this is why this is such an attractive quality to humans. However, we would tell you that the avatar that you are in could be the same if you could hold the same belief or perception about it, you see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that perspective. I love it. Would you like to leave the listeners with a final thought? We would just like everyone to recognize the power that they are. Oftentimes when we have sessions, people are so grateful, they're so happy, and we like to tell them that it is through their permission, it is through their openness that we have access to the portal or the connection that allows them to guide the meeting in the direction that is satisfying. 
we are not magic. We are not magicians. We are an open vessel, an open portal that connects to the divine part of them through their agreement. Humans don't realize how powerful they are. They don't realize that if they don't believe in something, they close the door to it. And that would include any access to information that we were looking to get, you see. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for your insight and your answers and your time and for your directness. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, we chose the name for a reason. Yes. Tell me. Athena in truth. You will always get the truth. And why is that? Because a human has a governor inside of them that can feel and know what truth is. Oh, that's very true. I love that. Oh, man, that's cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Athena. And we would like Robin now, please. Here I am. Thank you so much for sharing that. I do want to know, how are you feeling? Do you need a minute? Do you need some water? No, I feel totally fine. No problem at all. Do you remember everything or are you kind of in and out? Very much of a, a, a dreamlike state. Like I could maybe remember a few details, but by the time I leave my office in five minutes, everything goes, it's gone. That makes sense. Well, I asked Athena if they had last words for the listener, but I'd like to ask you the same thing as we wrap up here. What would you like to leave the listener with as it relates to consciousness and the work you do? Well, I'm just really grateful for where we are on the planet right now. I, I mean, I have nothing but wonderful things to say. I think we're headed in a great direction. Uh, all of the people that I am doing sessions with and that I'm coming into contact with are wanting to serve humanity in a better way. So there's going to be no doom or gloom really coming from me, from from my group, the way that I'm experiencing it. I have a lot of hope in people and in humanity. And I think that there's more and more people that are waking up and that are really understanding how they create their experience and that mean to do well in the world. And I know that there are some things that are going on right now that people are concerned about, but I know that that energy is being transmuted and that something beautiful is being made out of it. And once we can all align to that understanding, we're going to start seeing it here. I completely agree. Those are fantastic last words as well. Well, I'm really grateful for you joining me today and, and sharing this time. And I would love for you to tell listeners exactly where they can find you, find out what you're doing, more about you. I have a, a website called athenaintruth.com. Everything I'm doing is on there. I have podcasts that are free, some YouTubes that go up on occasion. There's courses and meditations, and there's activations that I do twice a month. I have a Q&A. People really like that. They get a Zoom link once a month where they come on with Athena for an hour. They can ask their questions in person. So there's all kinds of things that are interactive on the website that they can check out where they are able to reach me. There are private sessions if that's something that someone is looking for, but there's also those other avenues as well. Well, we will definitely have all that information and links in the show notes so that people can easily reach out to you and find you and stick around, you guys, and I'll share my takeaways on this topic. Wow, what a fantastic way to wrap up the season. I had a terrific time talking with Robin and Athena, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you didn't catch the last episode before this one, with Dr. Helene Wabe. She studies the science of channeling. I encourage you to go check that one out. One more thing I'd like to say before I share my thoughts on today's interview, though. I just want to thank everyone listening, truly, from the bottom of my heart. This season has been incredible for me, from the wonderful guests I met, to all the things I learned, to the amazing listeners who have liked, shared, and reached out. I could not be more pleased with how this season turned out. I send so much love and appreciation to you all and to my producers, Mishi Lance and Cynthia Lamb, and all the fabulous folks behind the scenes here. I just feel like the luckiest girl in the world. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about my chat with Athena. I liked when they talked about the signals that we send out to the universe through our beliefs and emotions. I talked in the last episode about my way of understanding that two-way street of energetic exchange that we have between our individual selves and consciousness as a whole, which I feel like is another way of expressing the same idea. Athena talked about recognizing that we are feelers and releasers of emotions and that we are signaling the universe with our feelings so that it may reflect back to us that which we are sending out. So when we send out worry, judgment, fear, and anxiety, we see things play out for and around us that reflect those emotions. And those emotions that we send out come from our beliefs. 
If you can think of even one experience from your life where any of those emotions or attachments led directly to a desired outcome, please email me and tell me about it. Because I don't think there is one time that has ever happened for anyone in the history of humanity. So if you're the exception to that, please share it with me. I can name about 10,000 times in my own life when fear, judgment, or anxiety led to unwanted consequences, but never once to a desired outcome. We often have this twisted belief about fear and anxiety and worry that it is somehow protecting us, benefiting us in some way. Again, ask yourself, if you insist on participating in these emotions, then at least be responsible enough to demand an example from your own life where this has benefited you. But if you have yet to see that play out in reality, then it's probably time to get really curious about that belief. Because we do know for a fact that those emotions lead to things like high blood pressure, unhealthy coping mechanisms, and all sorts of other mental and physical illnesses and diseases. I'd get really clear with myself on how I believe I'm benefiting from this illusion of protection. Athena talked extensively about judgment specifically, and I really loved that. In my experience, that is the single most difficult habit to overcome because judgment is the very foundation of every belief and definition we have. Because our experience as humans is so deeply rooted in duality, it takes a lot of intentional, conscious focus to release judgments to find acceptance and neutrality, and to see things from a higher perspective. And that's where our shadow work comes in. We can often get really overwhelmed and nervous by even the mention of shadow work. But if you just think of it as simply bringing awareness to that which you are unaware, or shining a light where there is an absence of light, or a shadow, it's just making what is unconscious conscious, just simply becoming aware of it. Once the illumination of awareness shines on the subconscious shadow, the hardest part's over. The rest is just grace and practice. It's not nearly as scary or overwhelming as people make it out to be, I promise. I'm reminded of the story of Dr. Hugh Lin's work with the ancient Hawaiian practice of Ho'oponopono. I don't have time to tell the story here, but if you aren't familiar with his remarkable story or the practice, I highly recommend you looking that up. It can be a game changer if you are ready for that level of consciousness. And if you're not ready to use it for collective results the way Dr. Hugh Lin did, it is also an incredibly powerful tool for inner child work or shadow work. I would definitely check that out if you're interested. If you want the spelling, it's H-O apostrophe O-P-O-N-O-P-O-N-O. I loved when Athena spoke about how all future moments are created in each present or now moment, as they put it, and how each individual human can have an enormous impact on the collective future by becoming the highest version of themselves that they can be, doing the shadow work, not allowing their creative energy to be used in ways and for outcomes that they do not support. Our attention is powerful, unbelievably powerful. We have to be mindful of where we're putting it, because if we're not using it, someone else is, and that's a guarantee. No one's energy is sitting in a little box waiting to be used. There is a constant flow, and if you don't know what your energy is creating, you might want to think about getting really curious about that. Maybe ask, why is it that in our society, we are encouraged to spread ourselves so thin, to spread our attention in a million different directions, every waking moment in an effort to try to keep up with what we are expected to know and who we're expected to be. That energy is being used, make no mistake. Ask yourself who it's working for, who is benefiting from it. If it's not you, stay curious until you get some clarity, because that energy is not going to waste. Athena's answers were bold and clear and straight to the point, and I loved that. So I don't really want to spend a lot of time going back over what they said, though I do recommend that you listen to their words multiple times, especially if they seemed a bit confusing or counter to your current way of thinking. Athena mentioned near the end of our interview that every human has a sort of governor inside them that can feel and know what truth is. We often override that knowing or that feeling with our subconscious beliefs and our ego resistance because that feeling is quiet and subtle and the ego mind is loud and demanding 
and very protective of our subconscious beliefs. If something felt triggering to you when Athena spoke, and by that I mean it caused you to feel defensive in any way, that is not your intuition. Intuition is not defensive. That is not the subtle knowing that I'm talking about here. Triggers are always an attempt by our subconscious to point out a shadow aspect, to give us a chance to acknowledge it and process it fully. The problem is that instead of tending to it by doing the work, we allow the ego to respond to the trigger with anger, defensiveness, judgment, and self-righteousness. If something did trigger a shadow aspect that you're carrying, please go back and listen to it again. Tell your ego just take a little nap for a minute because you got this. And then get curious. Ask yourself, what about this makes me angry or upset or defensive? What is the judgment that I am making on this statement? and of myself? What is it that I believe and am attached to that makes this upsetting or scary for me? If you sit with an intention to hear the answers and with the openness to accept the answers, you will get what you're looking for. I fully recommend receiving all incoming data through a lens of curiosity and scrutiny, whether it's from a group of channeled energy, a doctor, therapist, scientist, teacher, politician, parent, friend, or partner. It doesn't matter who it is. Your inner governor will always tell you the truth if you are open enough to hear it and feel it. It can be something that feels like butterflies or a knot in your stomach. It can be goosebumps or a tingling feeling somewhere in your body. It can come like a thought form. There's no one way and there's no right way to receive intuitive messages from your higher self. You just have to practice discerning the difference between the information coming from your ego self and your higher self. And in the beginning, there are going to be a lot of things that make you angry and trigger your fear of powerlessness. Our fear of powerlessness is where all other negative emotions come from. I think it was Gloria Steinem who said, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. I have found that to be an accurate and wise statement, but just keep going. It will eventually set you free. Thank you for listening to Consciousness Explored. Consciousness Explored is part of the Mira FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Making It and Just Between Coaches. A very special thanks to Robin for generously sharing her time and her gifts with us today. In the show notes, you'll find the link to her website, athenaintruth.com. That's A-T-H-E-N-A-I-N-T-R-U-T-H dot com. If you'd like to reach out to me, I would love to hear from you. My contact information is also in the show notes or just below on YouTube. I personally read and respond to all my emails, and I absolutely love hearing from you guys. If you haven't already, please subscribe or follow us on Mira CFM's YouTube channel or your favorite podcast player. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a comment or a starred review. It really is the best way to help us get these ideas to more people. Thanks. Thanks.